I've titled tonight's lecture, In the Mists of Time, and that's a nice sort of misty background over there. The Mists of Time is a lecture on Daniel chapter 2. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Isaiah 46, chapters, verses 9 and 10. So God says, I will tell you ahead of time what will happen from the beginning right until the end of time. And in Daniel, we have a key to the book of Revelation. In fact, the two books, Daniel and Revelation, go hand in hand. The symbolism that we find in the book of Revelation is actually borrowed from the whole of the Bible, but the images are borrowed from the book of Daniel specifically. Jesus says in Matthew 24, when he was questioned about the signs of the end, that we should study the book of Daniel in particular, it states that in Matthew 24. And of course, in the book of Revelation, it also says, Blessed are they who read and take to heart what is written in this prophecy. So, the end time books, those that have the sweep through history telling us the events as they will unfold, will be found in these great books of the Bible. So God declares, I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Either this is so or this is not so. Now there are many symbolic symbols used in the Bible and we can get very confused if we don't apply the right principles to what we are listening to. You have to apply biblical criteria in order to understand Bible prophecy. We cannot just take a symbol out of the air. For example, the Bible speaks about a beast. In Revelation, it talks about a beast. It talks about a mark of a beast. It talks about something that must be put into the hand and into the forest, and this represents the mark of the beast, for example. Well, what is the beast? You can do anything with that word beast. You could say, like many in the world say today, the beast is a computer. Some say even which one? They say it is a computer in Brussels. Well, does the Bible say beasts are computers? Yes or no? You have to stick to biblical criteria. The Bible uses symbols of animals. It uses, for example, lions and bears and things like that. Now, there are... Um, Sports teams that are known as the Lions. The British Isles rugby football team is known as the Lions. So am I to read into the Bible that the British rugby football team is going to play an important part at the end of time just because it says the Lions? Or the Bears, that's another sporting team. Is that going to be a criterion? Of course not. We have to use biblical criteria in order to deal with biblical things. So I've put together a little dictionary here of prophetic terms where they are defined in the Bible, and we have to use the Bible definitions. For example, white linen is righteousness, Revelation 19, verse 8. The white linen you saw represents the righteousness of the saints. A trumpet or a wind are symbols of war in the Bible, Revelation 49, 36. That is now in a prophetic sense. Prostitution. I wonder how many sermons have been preached about licentious women and prostitution and all of these things. When in actual fact, God uses the word prostitute in a prophetic sense to refer to idolatry, being unfaithful to God. And there are just numerous texts that are listed here which show that idolatry is prostitution. God even had a cryptic lesson for Israel. He even had a prophet of his marry a prostitute to give an object lesson of the unfaithfulness of the people of Israel towards their God. Water or sea in the Bible represents nations when it's in a prophetic sense. The waters you saw are peoples and nations and multitudes and kings. 
Revelation 17, verse 5. A woman in the Bible is a church. Ephesians 5, 22 to 24, 2 Corinthians, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Hosea, John, all of them refer to the symbolism of a woman representing the church. Christ is the bridegroom, the church is his bride. Zion is a symbol of God's people, Isaiah 51, 16, and a beast in the Bible, in a prophetic sense, is a kingdom. Daniel chapter 7, verse 17 says, And the beasts which you saw are kingdoms or kings. And a king stands for a kingdom. So it's not a football team, and it's not a computer, it's a kingdom. That's it. So if someone has a mark of the beast, then it is a mark of a kingdom. That's what it means. It cannot mean anything else. We have to stay with the Bible. A horn in the Bible also represents a king or a kingdom. So out of a kingdom can arise a number of horns. That means the kingdom will disintegrate and many kingdoms will arise out of that kingdom. A rock in the Bible, the rock in the Bible, is Jesus. That's what we sang in our theme song. Now there's a war between good and evil on this planet. And if someone doesn't want to believe that, switch on your television and have a look. And you will see that there's a war between good and evil. There's a war over every single soul on this planet, whether we want to acknowledge it or whether we don't. Now, a very interesting little key story in the Bible is Daniel chapter 2, where King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And in this dream, he dreams of certain events which shall unfold, but he forgets the dream, and then he is very confused, and the prophet eventually unfolds the dream for him. And in this dream, we can pick up some very interesting road signs of history and time. Now Nebuchadnezzar, also known as Nabuchoduri Usur, was the founder of the great Babylon. The original founder of Babylon was of course Nimrod, and then it had a period of greatness under Hammurabi, and then Nebuchadnezzar built it up to the glory of the Chaldeans, the greatest city that ever existed on the face of the planet. So Nebuchadnezzar was very, very proud of his achievements. Jerusalem was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC. And during this time, captives were taken to Babylon. And amongst them were, of course, the Hebrew faithful, such as Daniel and his friends. And here we see a relief of the captives actually being taken to Babylon as slaves. Many of them, when they were caught, they were made eunuchs to serve the king, but, well, to be eunuchs for the rest of their lives, never to have the honor or the pleasure of having children. So there were terrible times in those days. These young men, according to the biblical story, were then enrolled in the institutes of higher learning. They went to the university and they studied the language and they studied the wisdom of the Chaldeans. Bab Ilu is the site of Nebuchadnezzar's summer palace. Here it is, for example. And the word Babel has a very interesting connotation. Bab, El. Bab is a gate, a portal, and El is God. So the word Bab, El, Babel, means a portal to God. Now the Bible says there is someone else who calls himself the door, and that is Jesus Christ. He says, I am the door. So Jesus is actually saying, I am the Bab, the gate, through which one must enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
Jesus says, I am the door, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. So that is the door, the entryway into heaven. Bab El represents another entryway, another door whereby you try to climb into heaven by another way, another door. Bab Elu is then also a portal. The king was divine in the old days, although the Babylonian and Assyrian kings did not go that far. They were high priests generally. So in Daniel chapter 2 we read, now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. Now here we have a problem, immediately we have a problem. And the higher critics have such fun with verses such as these, you see. A little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. So the higher critics complained about this text because it says in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, but then a little bit further on it says in the third year of Daniel's captivity. And Daniel had completed three years of study when this took place and Nebuchadnezzar and these captives started off at the same time. So they were saying, well, how's this possible? You know, Nebuchadnezzar's in his second year and the others are in their third year. The Bible is pathetic. Makes simple mistakes like that. But then, of course, they didn't realize that the two systems, the Hebrew system of counting, was totally different to the Babylonian system. When a Babylonian king ascended to the throne, his first year was not counted. It was known as the year of ascension. So the second year of his reign would be the third year according to the Babylonian system and God does not acknowledge it. When he speaks about his Hebrew worthies, he sticks to his system where any part of a year was considered as a completeness. Any part of a day was considered as a completeness. That explains many things. For example, the crucifixion. Three days. Three days. And anybody who wants to work it out will say, now hang on a second, if he, Jesus died on Friday towards sunset and he stayed in the grave during the Sabbath and he rose on the first day of the week, that doesn't make three days in our reckoning today, but in the Hebrew mindset, which is inclusive reckoning, it does. Because any part of a day will count as day one. So because it was before sunset on Friday, that's day one. And it was a complete day in the grave, that's day two. And any portion of the day on the third day is day three. So that is, in the biblical record, three days. Three evening mornings, three days, nights. So no anomaly here, just reckoning according to the right systems. And his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. So the king summoned the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers and the astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. And when they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, now you know in our modern times we believe how primitive. Here the man has a dream and he summons the enchanters, and the sorcerers, and the astrologers, to tell him what he had dreamed. Now that's what kings in ancient days did. They were surrounded by these wise, insider, knowledgeable ones. And each one of these categories had a certain function. The enchanter would throw the charms and find out. The sorcerer would be a deep occultist who would use occult communications to find out. The astrologers would look at the stars to tell him what he had to do. Is it such an ancient custom or is it alive and well and living today in our century, yes or no? Do presidents of the United States make use of this system, yes or no? Ronald Reagan didn't do a move without consulting all of these categories. And Nelson Mandela in southern Africa will not make a move without having his Samgomas come and throw the bones and the astrologers tell him what to do. 
And the kings of Europe are no different. They are occultists in that sense. You can just study what the kingdoms do and what the kings and queens of England do, for example, and how they communicate with the spirit world in order to find out what they should do. Does not Prince Charles consult Mountbatten, who is already dead, when he has something important to do? Well, nothing has changed. Don't think that this is an ancient custom. This is a present-day custom, very much so. And the analogy tells us that things have not really changed. So all of these wise people came to the king and he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it means. Daniel 2, 1 to 3, the NIV. The King James actually says, this thing has gone from me, which means I cannot remember it. I cannot remember it, but I know it was vitally important. So please, if you really are what you say, then you must tell me what this means. The king answered and said to the Chaldean, This thing is gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made a dunghill. Ancient kings had much power. When a king spoke, that was it. You remember the book of Esther? If the king did not hold out his staff to whoever came in, that person was dead. He was dead. He was killed on the spot. He was taken out and executed if the king didn't give him the right to enter and to speak. Verse 10 says, the Chaldeans, now who are the Chaldeans? The Chaldeans are the learned ones. Those are the highly educated ones, the astronomers, the brilliant ones. And we have Chaldeans today. Some religious orders concentrate their most intellectual, most educated people in the world into certain orders which actually run many of our universities. And the very top universities in the world, the highest universities that we have in the world today, are run by categories of people that today would be the exact equivalent of the Chaldeans. Nothing has changed. So these are the educated ones answered before the king and said, there is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such a thing at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. See, the different categories, all of them were not able to do this. It is a rare thing that the king requireth, and there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. So God actually removed this thing from this king's mind so that he would not be able to just recall it and also to expose all of these categories of people. Verse 12, For this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. All. Now, obviously, that included all of those that had received this higher learning, which would then have included Daniel and his friends, because they had completed their education at the Babylonian Institute of Higher Learning. So all of them were sentenced to death on one day, just because they could not answer the dream. When Daniel heard that they were all going to be put to death, he went to Ariel, the king's guard, and said, is there any way that... I could speak to the king. And after he had given permission, Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mikhail, and Azariah, Mishael. Very interesting names here, actually. We haven't got time to go into all the details, but there's even a typology in the name of events as they will unfold. Daniel means judgment, people of judgment. Michael, the one who is what God is. Very interesting analogies there. Daniel 2, 17 and 18, he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. That's the basic story behind the story. In Daniel 2, verse 21, 
we have this statement, and he, God, changes the times and the seasons, he removes kings and sets up kings. So it's going to be a story of how kingdoms will arise and kingdoms will disappear on this planet. Daniel 2 verse 24 tells us of how the king is then informed that Daniel actually has an answer. Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king and I will interpret his dream for him. See, God in night vision gave Daniel not only a description of the dream, but also the solution to the dream. The king asked Daniel, also called the Belsassar, which is, of course, uh, his name given to him in place of Daniel, judgment. So the whole book of Daniel is about judgment. It's about the final judgment of this planet and the judgment of the various kingdoms as we go along. Bel, Sasa, Bel was the god of the Chaldeans. Bel, we'll deal a lot with this god, Bel, and uh, he's very much in vogue today. There are many, many, many organizations that name themselves after Bel to this very day. Also called Balsasa, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel 2.26. Did Daniel say, yes I can, yes I can. No, he didn't. Bel Tesasa. Bel, it, goddess. Shar, king, uzur, to protect. So, Belit, Bel is a male deity, Belit is a female deity. Whether they were male or female, they were interchangeable. That's an interesting uh, thought. We will go into that in greater detail in the future. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers. It's fascinating to me that every single one of these categories exists today and is being used by the world today, and by the leadership of the world today. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the, when? Latter days. Daniel 2, 27, 28. So Daniel chapter 2 is a book for our time. It's for our time. It gives something for all ages, but the climax of history, the Daniel, the judgment, the final judgment, comes in our time. Isn't it surprising that people say, cut the Old Testament off, we don't need it anymore? Well, Jesus said, when you see these things, when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing here, then let the reader of Daniel understand. Speaking about the future, Jesus himself points to Daniel, and it concerns our time. And he doesn't take the credit, he gives the credit to God. You see, there are two religious systems on this planet. The one system is man-centered, and the other is God-centered. And that is the battle for every person's soul on this planet. And you will be surprised who today advocates a man-centered religion. You will be surprised. I'll put them up on the screen, one after the other, for you as we go on. In Daniel 2.29, As you were lying there, O king, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. And this is basically what he dreamed. He saw a statue with a head of gold, silver arms and chest, bronze. And this head of gold was very magnificent. Two arms, hips of bronze, legs of iron, two legs, and then feet of iron and clay. And then he saw a rock hurtled towards earth, strike the statue and destroy it. And it struck at the feet. Nowhere else. 
It struck at the feet. Well, what does this dream mean? Well, the Bible is so kind as to tell us exactly what it means, so we don't even have to guess. You looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. That's what he dreamt. And you saw this rock come. Daniel 2, verses 32 to 33. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. So, it was a look into the future and it also concerned the last days. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, notice carefully, but not by human hands. So this intervention is not a human intervention, but what kind of an intervention? It's a divine intervention. It struck the statue on its feet. Please be very careful. It does not strike the statue on the hips. Are you with me? It does not strike the statue on the hips. Now, why would I emphasize that? Is that important? Yes, it happens to be important because whole religious systems in the world out there have the statue strike the hips. When the statue is not struck at the hips, the rock strikes the feet. The rock does not strike the hips. So already just with this simple analogy, half of the religious world out there, Christian religious world, has something wrong. Seriously wrong. All right, that's what the Bible says. Check it out for yourself. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Daniel 2, 34. So who is this rock? Obviously, if it's not a human intervention, it's a divine intervention. So if you are expecting some aid from some superpower, whichever that superpower may be, I have news for you. The final intervention is a divine intervention. It is the second coming of Christ. Then, notice the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were broken to pieces. Now hang on a second. If this statue is sequential, why, when you strike the feet, is the iron... That's the legs. The clay, that's the feet and the iron. The bronze, that's the hips. The silver, that's the chest. And the gold broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. Why is the whole lot destroyed when it strikes the feet? You see, if these kingdoms occur one after the other, then does this make any sense? Yes, it does. But only if the philosophy of the head advanced and built out in the philosophy of the chest, increased greatly in the philosophy of the hips, and incorporated into the philosophy of the iron, and disseminated to the world in the philosophy of the iron and clay, when that philosophy is finally destroyed, all of history's contribution to the kingdom of the other party, the enemy of God, come to an end. Everything. Do we today teach Babylonian philosophy? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. I have a lecture called The Wine of Babylon. You will be stunned how much Babylonian philosophy we teach. Do we teach Medo-Persian philosophy? Absolutely we do. Is the religion of Mithraism alive and well and living in the world today? Yes, the greatest religious power in the world, the most powerful religious power in the world teaches Mithraism. Very interesting. That's Medo-Persian. Do we have Greek philosophy in the world today? Absolutely. Where's the, where does the theory of evolution come from? It started with Aristotle. Where, do our modern, where does our modern thinking on 
just about every science in the world come from? It's Greek philosophy. What about the iron? Do we have anything to do with Roman teachings? Absolutely. Our entire judicial system is based on Roman thinking, which has incorporated all those others. And the feet of iron and clay, they are just the heirs of a system gone before. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. This is very important. Wind is a symbol of war. War will, this final war will totally destroy the kingdoms of earth. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain. Mountain is a symbol in the Bible of a kingdom. And filled how much of the earth? The whole earth. There won't be different nations anymore like we have today. So if you have your hopes on any one of them, forget it. This, this prophecy says no. Daniel 2, 35. Isaiah 65, 17. For behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. And then he interprets the dream. Thou, O king, and he was the king of Babylon. He stood for Babylon. Art a king of kings. Very interesting nuance here in the Bible. Lowercase k, lowercase k. Wow. There's another king of kings who is uppercase k, lowercase k. Who's that? That's Jesus. He's king of kings and lord of lords. Here's another one that calls himself king of kings. And he was known as king of kings. He was the king of kings, the ruler. Is there another power today that has a title, an official title, King of Kings? The answer is yes. There is a power today so mighty, so invasive in the world, that it would surprise us. And the title that it bears is King of Kings. Babylonian philosophy living today. For the God of heaven has given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory... You, O king, are a king of kings, lowercase k. You are this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another what? Kingdom, inferior to thee. To thee. Daniel 2 verse 39. So Babylon will fall and will be replaced by another kingdom, inferior. Gold is a precious metal. Silver is a less precious metal. But silver is harder than gold. So the ultimate philosophy of a king of kings was in the head of gold. The ultimate philosophy of Bab El, another portal to heaven, was in the gold. It was strengthened in the next kingdom, although it became more brutal and less refined. It's chest and arms of silver. There are two components to a chest and to an arm. And there will be two components to the next kingdom as well. The whole earth prostrate at her feet. Babylon was never to dissipate, was never to be destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar thought he had built up a kingdom that would never go away. Here is an inscription that was found sealed by a seal of Nebuchadnezzar where it says, May it last forever. He could not conceive of a kingdom that would be destroyed. But Daniel pointed to him and he said to him, The kingdom will disappear. Your kingdom will disappear. This proud ruler said, Whoa, whoa, never. And what did he do? After he had humbled himself at first, later on he hardened his heart. And he thought to himself, never. I will defy the king of kings. My kingdom of gold will never be destroyed. Never will it go to silver, to bronze, to iron, to iron and clay. Never. It will stand forever. Build me a statue, pure gold, head to foot. What was he saying? What was he saying when he was doing that? He was defying the God of heaven. He was saying... I defy you. I will set up my kingdom and you will not destroy it. Is it possible that there is a power today that is saying the same thing? I defy you. I will set up a kingdom and it will not be destroyed. Is it possible? We'll see it's more than possible. 
It's more than possible. It's a sad reality in the world we're living to today. So this king might have been arrogant at that stage, but there's an equally arrogant power today doing the same thing. Daniel 3, 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. So he called everyone, including the Hebrews, who had interpreted this vision for him and said, bow down. When you hear the sound of the music and the horn and the sitter and the lyre and all kinds of music, bow down. Is music an instrument used today to get nations together, yes or no? Is it? Wow, it surely is. So these three said we will not bow down and even if, he does not help us. We will not bow down. Who else says that? Job said that. Job had that kind of faith. Job said, even if he slay me, yet will I serve him. Wow, that's great. So they were thrown into the fiery furnace. And what happens? The cords burn away. The soldiers that throw them in are burnt to death. And Daniel 3.26, Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. Because when he looked in, he saw a fourth amongst them who looked, King James Version, like the Son of God. Other virgin, versions who looked like a son of the gods. Big difference between the two. Daniel 3.28, Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. So the Torah story tells us that Nebuchadnezzar was humble. Did you know that Nebuchadnezzar is the only heathen king who has the privilege of writing a chapter in the Bible? Wow, he got to write a chapter in the Bible, the story of his conversion, read it in the book of Daniel. And Nebuchadnezzar, I believe, will be in heaven one day because he was converted, his pride was humbled. But this is what it looked like. It was a magnificent city. Here is the emblem of Babylon, the lion, hanging gardens. He built this for his wife, Amuea, who longed for mountains, and here was a flat area. She was not very happy. So he said to her, I'll build you a mountain, and he built it for her. You know, those were kings in those days. They had power. Here is the famous Ishtar Gate, which you can still find in the Pergamon Museum. Beautiful reliefs of the original stones. Cuneiform writings that have been dug up tell the story of Nebuchadnezzar. These portals for the astonishment of multitudes of people with beauty I adorned. For the astonishment of men I have built this house. Nabonidus, now who was Nabonidus? He was the father. And to Balsasha, the exalted son, the offering of my body, the father of who? Balsasha. Isn't that interesting? You see, the higher critics here had some fun again. The Bible talks about the final king of Babylon being Belshazzar. And uh, the critics said, no, no, he wasn't king. Nabonidus was king. But what they didn't realize, not having the cuneiform writings to decipher at that stage, was that Nabonidus had withdrawn himself into religious service. He was a highly religious man, and he served in the Babylonian priesthood, and he gave the rulership to his son. So this was an inscription that was found. And to Belshazzar, the exalted son, the offering of my body, do thou place the adoration of the great deity in his heart. May he not give way to sin, may he be satisfied with life's abundance, and may reverence for the great divinity dwell in his heart of Belshazzar, my firstborn favorite son. God speaks to modern man, page 154. Bible vindicated. In 1882, an inscription was found confirming that Nabonidus had left the kingship to his son. In 1916, an inscription was found in which there was a joint oath 
of Balsasa and Nabonidus. There again, the higher critics blew it. The Bible was proved right. 1924, they found the famous inscription, I conferred kingship to my son Belshazzar. Bite the dust, higher critics. Bible wins. Round one for them. Nothing for the, for the enemies of that. And then the writing appeared upon the wall, and we hear the story of the old prophet Daniel being called in to interpret the writing on the wall. Many. God has numbered your kingdom, Belshazzar, and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And Peres, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Very interesting. Two arms, Medes and Persians. And the prophet interprets a writing written by a finger against the wall. Do you know that in the Bible, there are only four times when God writes with his finger? First time he writes the Ten Commandments with his finger, the Bible says, he wrote them on two tablets of stone. Then Moses smashed them when he came down and found the, the Israelites in idolatry. And then he hewed new stones. And again, God wrote with his finger what he had written on the first one. And then here in Babylon, at the fall of Babylon, God wrote with his finger. So God wanted to make very sure that everybody realized that he will bring Babylon to an end. He wrote it with his finger. And at the end, the Bible says there is another kind of Babylon in the book of Revelation which will come to an end just as surely. And what's the fourth time when God wrote with his finger? Jesus wrote with his finger in the sand. Interesting. That's the only record we have of Jesus writing something with his finger. Unwilling Babylon. Jeremiah 51, 9, we would have healed Babylon, but she cannot be healed. Revelation 2, 21, I have given her time to repent of her immortality orality, but she is unwilling. There is ancient Babylon, there's modern Babylon. Who is this modern Babylon? Bible names Cyrus 150 years before his birth. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 45 says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates and the gates shall not be shut. The Bible predicts this King Cyrus would come, and he would set free. The Bible calls him the Anointed One. Do you know that the Bible uses this terminology for Cyrus, and it uses it for Jesus? So this heathen king here, who brings to an end Babylon, is used as a typology of the great king who will come and bring an end to final Babylon. Very interesting analogy. Very interesting. Cyrus Cylinder with the whole story in cuneiform writing of how it happened. I am Cyrus, king of the world, the great and just king, king of Babylon, king of Sumer and Akkad, king of the four corners of the world, son of Cambyses, when I stepped into Babylon as a friend and ascended the throne amidst cheers of joy and pageantry in the governor's palace my countless soldiers roamed Babylon in peace and sincerity. I forbade harassment and terror. All over Sumer and Akkad, I strove for peace in Babylon and all other cities. I abolished forced labor in respect with citizens of Babylon, which was against their social status. I helped restore destroyed houses. I accommodated them again with, with a peaceful place. Ducks and doves, I tried to preserve their habitats. See, God is going to restore all things as well. The army marched in under the gates of Babylon. They had been left open. The river was diverted because God changes times and seasons and removes kings and sets up kings. And it's he who gives wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know not understanding. That brought to an end the Babylonian kingdom. And now the next kingdom is to come. We will do that in another session.
539 B.C. to 331 B.C., the next kingdom to rule the earth, the Medo-Persians, came to follow on after Babylon. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 39, we read about this kingdom. Then another kingdom, a third kingdom of bronze, will shall rule over all the earth. That's the next one to come. I am persuaded that there was no nation, city, nor people where his name did not reach. There seems to me to have been some divine hand presiding both over his birth and actions. Historical Library, Book 16, Chapter 12. So the Bible describes the rise of the Medo-Persian Empire and its fall to this mighty king, Alexander the Great, who would destroy this army. Do you know that Alexander destroyed the Medo-Persian army with an army of only 45,000 soldiers? And the Medo-Persians had an army of one million soldiers? He flattened them. He was a great strategist and knew exactly what he was about. So the Greek Empire followed upon the Medo-Persian Empire. The Medo-Persian Empire contributed to the religion of Babylon. It took the religion of Babylon, refined it in the Mithraic system, which it handed over to the next generation. And Mithraism then resurfaces later as a prominent re insider religion of the elite of Rome. Very interesting story. But the Greek philosophy was the great foundation stone for many, many philosophies in the world today. So Greeks follows on the Medo-Persian Empire. Finally, after the Greek Empire, Daniel 2.40, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. Now, if we look at the soldiers as they were in the ancient days, Greece and Rome are a very interesting comparison. Here is the armory of the Greek soldiers. Notice that it's bronze. That was their armor. They used bronze. And then came the Roman soldier. Here's a Roman legionnaire. And what was their armor? Iron. Isn't that interesting? So even this symbolism is fascinating. So we switch from bronze to iron. And the legionnaire had a fantastic armory. It had this little belt here in the front to protect, and the shield that protected even the soldiers, uh, the shoulders of the soldiers. I have to watch my S's here. And uh, this short, stubby sword, they were a tremendous force. And of course, the power of Rome was unparalleled. Iron is harder than bronze. Rome was mightier in its power than the Greeks were. Here are some of the ruins of the Roman Empire. The fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdues all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. Daniel 2.40. So this is a cruel kingdom. Were the Romans particularly cruel? What did they do to anyone that dissented? What happened to them? They crucified them. That was pretty harsh. At the fall of Jerusalem, for miles, there were just crucifixes. Crucifixes. Everybody was just crucified. You didn't mess with Rome. On June 22, 168 BC, at the Battle of Pydna, Persis, king of Macedonia, was completely crushed by the armies of Rome. On this day perished the empire of Alexander the Great. Yeah, 144 years after his death. So there it perished. So the famous historian Edward Gibbon says, the images of gold, silver, brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. The history and decline and fall of the Roman Empire. The whole world agrees that iron was the kingdom of Rome. In the second century, Hippolytus wrote of Rome, Rejoice, blessed Daniel, thou hast not been in error, already the iron rules. Did you know that when Alexander the Great marched into Jerusalem, the scribes marched towards him with the Torah and said to him, You will rule. Daniel said, You will conquer. And because of that, Alexander did not destroy Jerusalem 
but just incorporated them? The Bible says ahead of time who would rule. Now many a critic has come up and said, oh, but surely Daniel must have lived after the events. The Bible is wrong. You know that the Bible has been vindicated on that score? Because the Dead Sea Scrolls have portions of the book of Daniel where it changes from Aramaic to Hebrew. That little piece is there, and when they study the Aramaic, which they said was late Aramaic, oops, what did they find in the Dead Sea Scrolls? That it was Medo-Persian Aramaic. So the book of Daniel is authenticated from that time right up until all these events are described. So it was written all ahead of time. You cannot mess with the Bible. You cannot mess with it. So this mighty power, Rome, came to destroy. Historian Charles Rollins says, they, the Romans, seized indiscriminately all provinces and kingdoms and extended their empire over all nations, in a word, they pres prescribed no other limits to their vast projects than those which deserts and seas made it impossible to pass. Ancient History, Volume 4, 79. So from 168 BC to 476 AD, Rome, the Iron Monarchy, ruled supreme. Now there were two legs of iron. That's interesting. Rome was split into two halves, the Eastern Empire and the Western Empire. And the emperor, for many years after Constantine, ruled from the Eastern Byzantine Empire. He ruled the whole kingdom. But Western Rome followed another path. Very interesting story that we have. Just as you saw, says Daniel 2.41, that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so are there elements of Rome in the feet and in the toes, yes or no? Absolutely, still there. The iron is still there, the iron isn't gone. So this will be a divided kingdom. Is the world trying to restore the Holy Roman Empire, yes or no? What is the unification of Europe all about? Have you thought about that? So this will be a divided kingdom. Daniel 2.42, as the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong, partly brittle. Has history proved that the nations of Europe were sometimes strong and sometimes weak, and sometimes one ruled and sometimes another? Wasn't Germany mighty and France mighty and Britain mighty? Yes or no? Didn't the Danes rule for a while, etc., etc., etc.? Wasn't the Austrian Empire mighty at one stage with its kingdom? Absolutely. So, history has proved that, right? Jeremiah 18.6, Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. These kingdoms might be arrogant, but uh, they would be replaced. They would be divided. And they would be divided into... Ten. That's what the Bible says. There would be ten toes that would come forth. Now, these ten toes are very interesting. Where do these ten toes arise? In the Western Empire or in the Eastern Empire? Very important question. And the Bible tells us quite plainly that they arise in the Western Empire and that the Western Empire would exert an influence over the entire world. Does the Western Empire exert its influence over the entire world? Yes or no? Absolutely. It is European knowledge and wisdom that was transported to the entire world. It was Europeans that conquered South America. It is from the Western European nations that the United States and Canada and all its components was incorporated into that wisdom, that philosophy. It is Western ideology which comes from European stock which is controlling world events. The superpowers today have all, can all trace their roots to 
Western Europe. So who were these Anglo-Saxons and Franks and Alemanni and Lombards and Ostrogoths and Neruli and Burgundians and Visigoths and Swabian Vandals? Who were they? So this is the division of the Western Roman Empire. And notice that there is a very interesting nation over here which is known as the Ostrogoths. And then there is another nation over here which is known as the Visigoths. They were the Burgundians and they were the Franks and uh, the Anglo-Saxons. And the Franks and the Romans had a very strong alliance at one stage. The Ostrogoths and the Visigoths, they had a slightly different religion to the rest of Europe, and there were many, 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 many wars that were fought over this issue. So the Alemanni today are the Germans. The Germans are the remnant of the Alemanni. The Swiss, the Burgundians, the French, the Franks, the Italians, the Lombards, the English, the Saxons, the Portuguese, the Suevi, the Spanish, the Visigoths, but three of them, the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths, are extinct. They're gone. They have been wiped out. The Ostrogoths, the last ones to be wiped out, a mighty, mighty nation that controlled all events in Rome. They ruled over Rome itself. The Visigoths were in Spain, and they had a slightly different religion. There were many, many, many wars fought in Spain. Spain was divided, terribly divided into a northern and a southern half, and terrible bloodshed was found in Spain. But the Heruli and the Vandals and the Ostrogoths were totally destroyed. History tries to tell us that these three were destroyed because they had a Arian philosophy, which means they propagated the idea that Christ did not have divinity and that they were therefore destroyed. But we only have information from one source. All their writings, everything that they wrote has been destroyed. All their libraries have been destroyed. So we don't really know what they believe. In actual fact, the Ostrogoths probably received their religion from Palestine and had a very pure form of Christianity based on the Bible. And that is why they were destroyed. But I haven't got time to go into that. That would be a whole lecture, a few lectures, all by itself. So let's concentrate on this prophecy. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. So originally, when Rome fell, it was divided into ten. Three of them were eventually destroyed. Today we have the remnants. And they would mix themselves with the seed of men. They would try to reunite it by intermarriage. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Daniel 2, verse 43. So we had the great kings of Europe trying to unite Europe through marriage. And so we have Queen Diana and King Frederick trying their utmost to bring the nations together. Here's Frederiksborg Castle in Denmark from where the, the uh, famous kings and queens ruled. Daniel 2.43, where else thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seas of men. They shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. There you have the famous Queen Victoria and King Christian. Did you know that Queen Victoria was totally un-English? Did you know that she was German? Did you know that she even spoke German on her deathbed when she was dying, her mother tongue came back? She was a German queen. And King Christian of Denmark and her offspring mingled with the seeds of men, all the nations united, they were all together. So different kings tried to reunite the kingdoms. Here you have the Pope crowning Charles the Great, Charlemagne, king of the Holy Roman Empire, because supposedly he had managed to reunite Europe. And as that crown went onto his head, the kingdom fell apart and divided. So for a brief moment, they'd come together again, and then they fell apart. And so the Charleses and the Louis. And all these kingdoms of the earth and the great kingdoms tried to reunite Europe. And then came this Frenchman, Napoleon Bonaparte. 
His brother was the grand master of Freemasonry in Spain. Very interesting. He was the grand master. And all of these had insider connections. And he wanted to reunite Europe. And at the Battle of Waterloo, well, he met his Waterloo. Very interesting history. We'll be talking about this in some more detail because everything we hear is not necessarily what is true. Here Napoleon is taken into exile. Napoleon said, I wanted to found a European system, a European code of laws, a European court of appeals. There would have been but one people throughout Europe. Europe would soon have become one nation. The Watchman, 1941. He tried to reunite it. Thirty years after Waterloo, Dr. Thomas Arnold said, the deliverance of Europe from the dominion of Napoleon was affected neither by Russia, nor by Germany, nor by England, but by the hand of God. What was the principal adversary of this tremendous power? By whom was it checked and resisted and put down? By none and by nothing but the direct and manifest interposition of God. Lectures on Modern History, Lecture 3. It's very interesting. Napoleon had very heavy artillery, and he would have outgunned the much lighter artillery of the British, for example. But on that day, suddenly a fine rain fell, and all his heavy artillery became bogged down in the mud, and they couldn't move it. And so the lighter more mobile artillery of the other forces was just what was needed to blow them to smithereens. So who won the battle? The weather or the artillery? It's interesting that some great politicians in the past have said, history is on the side of the greatest artillery, the heaviest artillery. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secret and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. This is an interesting verse. Daniel 2, 28. The latter days. Well, if you read your Bible, if you read Luke and Matthew 24, Luke chapter 21, you will see the events as they unfold. How one kingdom after the other will make war, and the very final events will be nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, wars, famines, all kinds of things, hearts failing for fear. That's what the Bible says. And the next event will be, says the Matthew 24 and Luke 21, the coming of Christ in glory, the stone that will bring an end to all the earthly kingdoms. Now, this was Kaiser Wilhelm, he tried to bring an end to the division. And here's a very interesting true story. At a cathedral in France, in Metz, there's a statue outside the cathedral, the statue over here, of the prophet Daniel with his finger pointing to his scroll. Very interesting prophet, uh, prophet here. And Kaiser Wilhelm, he was very concerned about this statue. And then one day... The cathedral needed repair. The roof had become, uh, it fell apart and it had to be replaced. And so they asked Kaiser Wilhelm for the money to repair the cathedral. And Kaiser Wilhelm said the following. He said, you have a statue in front of your cathedral of Daniel. So obviously he knew what Daniel said. And obviously he was annoyed by the prophecy. So he said, I will give you the money to repair your cathedral if you remove his head. Now remember these statues are in sections and put my head on top of the statue. Do you think they did it? This is history. You can check it out. Do you think they did it? Yes, they did it. They did it. And they put the head of the original Daniel into the archives. And he replaced the roof. And so for a while... Kaiser Wilhelm's head was on the statue. What was he trying to say? He was like Nebuchadnezzar of old. He was saying, I don't care what your prophet said. I will do it. Isn't that what he was saying? I don't care what your prophet said. I will do it. A fascinating history. Well, here he is, dead, but this is not him. This is his dog, Senta. 
begleitete seine Majestät den Kaiser im Weltkriege 1914 bis 1918. His dog accompanied the Kaiser during the First World War, 1914 to 1918. And then, eventually, another would arise. Daniel 2.21, and he changes times and seasons and removes kings and sets up kings. And if you, Kaiser Wilhelm, think that you can put your head on the statue of Daniel, saying, I will do it my way, and you, God, will not have any influence of it, you'll be dead, and it won't work. And there was the next one. Now, here's a fascinating story. Here was another man. Do you think he understood the prophecies of Daniel? Do you think he was interested? Adolf Hitler was interested in the occult world like no other before him. There were two who were highly interested in the occult world. The one was Napoleon. Napoleon, in fact, sent his whole one of his whole army corps to Egypt to go and find out the source of the power of the pharaoh that threw his staff and it turned into snakes. Did you know that? And it is the French who discovered what in Egypt? The Rosetta Stone, from which all the hieroglyphics have been unfathomed. Isn't that an amazing story? And they studied the secrets of the power of the Egyptians, and in the occult world, this knowledge is incorporated in the Hermetic books. They studied the origin of Ham, Hermes, son of Her, son of Ham, and the occult knowledge, and they compiled huge volumes on the history of Egypt. This man over here was an occultist of the highest order. He was an insider initiate in the occultism. Did you know that the entire SS was built up on occult principles? Did you know that? And isn't it interesting that he sent an entire division to where? To Egypt. And that the German archaeologists were the one who did the great digs under the protection of Rommel. And there the insider knowledge was gathered of the occult principles which dictate many a king and ruler today. We're going to talk about some very interesting things in this series. Adolf Hitler knew about the prophecy of Daniel. How do we know? He gave an interesting instruction. He contacted the cathedral at Metz and said... Remember that you have Kaiser Wilhelm's head on that statue? Take it off. Put the head of Daniel back. What was he saying? What was he saying? Daniel's head went back onto the statue. He was saying, with or without that head, I'll do it. Wow. Fascinating stuff. History is more interesting than we believe. Really it is. If you make an a study of the occult world and how it has influenced our great political leaders in the past, you'll be surprised. And here Adolf Hitler came, and here is the symbol that is used, the swastika, which is the symbol of sun worship. It's the symbol of Lucifer. It is used by the Theosophy Society, which says Lucifer is the Logos, the serpent, the savior. Exactly the same symbol is used by Theosophy. And Theosophy, is it dead? Oh no, theosophy is alive and well and forms the central theme of the greatest powers that rule the world today. And we will be revealing some of these things in the lectures to come. This is interesting stuff. The eagle used as the symbol of deity. You see, the Bible uses the eagle as the symbol of God. Like an eagle that rises up, I will take you under my wings. That is the symbol of God. Lucifer wants to be like the Most High. He takes the symbol of the eagle, which was a symbol in Egypt of Horus. Fascinating. And there it is, the eagle with the swastika. And the swastika can be left-handed swastika or a right-handed swastika. If it is the left-handed or the right-handed, it makes no difference. It represents the God in his evil and in his light form or in his male or in his female form. 
It doesn't matter which one you use. Secret societies today use the very one in the mirror image today and say, but it's something else. It's not something else. Buddhism uses that symbol. Buddhism, the foot of Buddha has swastikas under every single toe. It's just the reverse one. Makes no difference. It's just the other six of the deity that is being on it. So what is happening here to the world? Is there an agenda behind the scenes? What does this circle and this swastika really mean? Regarding the First World War, Winston Churchill said after the end of the World War of 1914, was Winston Churchill a member of a secret fraternity? Yes or no? Yes, he was. Isn't that fascinating? Was Stalin a member of a secret fraternity? Yes or no? Yes, he was. Well, maybe history is not as boring as you thought, young guys. Isn't that so? I always thought history was boring when I was a kid. But today I find it fascinating, putting the pieces together. Wow. Regarding the First World War, Winston Churchill said after the end of the World the War of 1914, there was a deep conviction and almost universal hope that peace would reign in the world. The Gathering Storm, page 3. After the First World War. That's interesting. Well, did any of these great rulers, whether it was the Kaiser Wilhelms or the Napoleons or the Louis or the Charleses or the Hitlers, did they succeed? No. Europe was more divided after the war than before the war. Ha! Huh, but that division was deceptive, as we will see. And then the walls came down and empires started crumbling and the great people of the world, the Lenins and the Stalins that had murdered their millions for very clandestine reasons, suddenly these empires crumbled. The Mawa must fall and the wall must fall. All of these great leaders from Lech Walesa to this lady over here, Thatcher, to Khrushchev and Gorbachev and the queens, do they belong to secret orders? Do they? Who's the head of the Bilderbergers? Who's the queen of the Bilderbergers? Yeah, she is. That's very interesting. Is there such a thing as a Gorbachev Foundation with its seat in New York? Yes, there is. Very interesting things. And then the founder of the KGB comes down. A symbol falls. Does it really fall? Does it really fall? Who rules? in Russia today? Who is the head of Russia today? Putin. What was he? He was the head of the KGB. You see, isn't that interesting? So they take down a symbol and the people think the oppression is gone? When the oppression is not gone at all, it's just taken another robe. It's like a chameleon, changes color, but the essence, it doesn't change. And the God of heaven, is he watching? Yes, the God of heaven is watching. He told us ahead of time it would happen. And he told us in great detail. Soviet Union no longer exists. Three republics unite. Gorbachev obsolete. Bush needs recovery time. Blah, blah, blah. Reading Europe's future. Can we all get along in the hands of the people? It's more than money, monetary union, sea of troubles, a currency storms, blows, European unity, of course. Leland Stowe said, humanity has been given a suspended sentence, but its days of grace are fearfully short, while time remains, page 343. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Now, I want you to think seriously tonight, all those who are here present. Is the world preaching that we are heading towards a kingdom of peace? Yes or no? Yes. But it will be a worldly kingdom. Where do they want to set up a final kingdom of peace? Up there somewhere in Jerusalem? Are they fighting about it? What does God say? He will bring to an end what? How many of the kingdoms on this earth? All of them. That's what God says. All of them. And He will set up a kingdom. 
Do you think he needs the armies of the world to do it for him? Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. That's what the Bible says. For he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has what? Passed away. Revelation 21, 4. We must not be deceived into believing that the powers on this earth are going to achieve the objective that they're fighting for. They will not achieve it. It will be brought to an end. They will appear to achieve it. How do we know that? Because the Bible says, when they say, peace, peace, when will the nations on earth say that? When they appear to have obtained their objective. Isn't that right? What does the Bible say? What will happen then? Sudden destruction. And who will that destruction come from? It will come from God. And why would the God of heaven have to intervene to destroy that final unity? Why would he have to do that? Because it is an occult unity. It is a unity against God. It is an anti-Christos unity. Scary stuff. The world is terribly deceived today. We need to study these prophecies carefully and unfold them and unravel them and to see the finer nuances so that we cannot be deceived when a preacher stands up and says the Antichrist lived in the past, he was a Greek king, his name was Antiochus Epiphanes IV, but he was destroyed by the rock. Hello? The rock struck the feet, didn't strike the hips, didn't strike a Greek king. Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 9, be careful how we interpret the prophecy. We cannot have a wrong spin on this ball. Christ will return, the rock of all ages. Verse 35, And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, a mountain in the Bible, a kingdom, and filled the whole earth. God himself is going to set up a kingdom. The dream is certain. And the interpretation thereof is sure. Daniel 2.45. Now we've had very little detail tonight. But we've had a pretty accurate sweep through history. And would you agree that Daniel was just spot on? Yes or no? Absolutely. Daniel was spot on. Now I have sad news for you. Terribly sad news for you. Daniel is going to take the picture. Tonight's picture was like a picture you give to a child to color in. It's just the outline. And then you give the child the crayons and you say, color in the picture. Now, in our next lecture, we'll do Daniel chapter 7. And we're going to color in the picture. And then it gets scary. Because then we will see who the real power is. And some of us will be hurt. Some of us will be shocked. Some of us may say, I never want to hear any more of this. But I would encourage you to keep on coming because there is a fascinating solution to this. Did you know that the book of Revelation takes this final great battle between good and evil, which is a secret battle? It's a secret battle. The very first words Jesus uses when asked, what is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? The very first thing he says is, be careful lest anyone deceive you. Deception is the name of the game. Are there wolves in sheep's clothing deceiving God's people? Is the world being led down some garden path, faithfully following, thinking they are doing something good when they are being led into the pits of hell? Is it possible? If we believe the prophets, and if we study them carefully, and even if it hurts, and believe you me, I've stood on the other side of the fence. And when I studied the prophecy, I was hurt. And my family was hurt. 
and there were buckets of tears. But now, I have buckets of hope. Buckets of hope. Because God has shown me and has shown everybody in the world through his word, and that's the only place where we can find it, that there is hope. But he has also outlined the entire deception of our time, and we need to know. There's a very small crowd here tonight, a very small crowd. The whole world needs to know what the deception is. So I would like to encourage you to bring your friends and call them off the streets, go to the highways, go to the byways, invite people to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Not many rich, not many wise, not many of high repute will listen to you. But go into the highways and byways and bring them here and let's look at the prophecies. And I make a vow to you. If I speak anything that is contrary to the word of God, leave. Leave. If it doesn't say so, leave. Test every word I say. Put it into the checks and balances. Use the word of God as your filter. And if you can show me that I'm wrong, I'll change. I promise. I don't want to do anything that's not in line with God's will. That's my challenge. We will stick to the word of God. And we will see exactly what's happening in our time. It's scarier than you think. But we have hope. Because the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And we're right in front of the door. And I, for one, would like you all to be part of that kingdom. May God bless you and keep you until we come together for the coloring in episode of Daniel chapter 7.